everyone. Thank you for checking out my YouTube channel, The Study of Antiquity and the Middle Ages. My name is Nick Barksdale, and today I am excited to announce I am bringing you a very special episode and presentation from the History of the World podcast by none other than Chris Haslow. This episode, which will follow this introduction, is titled The Late Bronze Age Collapse. I am really, really excited about this episode. It covers a variety of subjects dealing with the Sea Peoples and the Late Bronze Age collapse. From violent migrations to the effects of climate change, it really goes in-depth, immersing the viewer and listener into a world of economic chaos, crisis, violence, and honestly, a resetting of human society in the ancient Near East. And you'll get to actually watch as some civilizations try to climb out of that chaos and violence, and some of them will succeed and some of them will not. I am thoroughly excited to bring you guys and gals this episode, and uh, I'm really happy to have been able to do a lot of the artwork for it. And honestly, Chris Haslow has been very gracious. The History of the World podcast has been very, very kind to me, very gracious. I'm very excited that they're offering me their content to actually provide you guys um, on YouTube. And also, if you would, in the description below, you'll see a variety of links taking you to a variety of sites that include the History of the World podcast. Definitely check out his stuff. It is absolutely amazing. I cannot recommend it enough. Give him some likes, some stars, some shares, and let him know that the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages sent you his way. All right, and before we get to it, I'm just gonna let you know I'm very happy to announce that the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages has hit over 18,000 subscribers, and we're gonna be at 20,000 before we know it. Thank you all so much for your support, for your encouragement, for your subscriptions, for your views. I really appreciate it, and honestly, I'm so happy to be doing this with all of you. So now, kick back, enjoy your weekend, and let's get to it in a story that involves the Sea Peoples, the Mycenaeans, the Ancient Egyptians, the Hittites, the Mitanni, the Edomites, the Kassites, and the Assyrians, along with a variety of other people, and let's see how the story goes. Welcome to the History of the World podcast. My name is Chris Hasler. And you're listening to Volume 2, The Ancient World. This is Episode 6, The Late Bronze Age Collapse. Joel Texier was born in 1802 in the French city of Versailles, which is in the modern Yvelines department of France. Texier trained as an architect, but was very interested in archaeology, and as such he was given the opportunity to go on an exploratory mission to Anatolia in 1833. The following year he would stumble across a site of extreme significance to ancient history. The site was near the village called Boyskoy, which is in the modern Turkish district of Boyskali, and it was the ancient Hittite capital of Hattusha. The subsequent excavations at Hattusha not only revealed clues about the culture of the region at the time, but also clues about the ultimate fate of the city. We can see that the royal palace was burned down and that the city was abandoned, destroyed, and that was in around 1180 BCE. So who was responsible for the destruction of Hattusha, which coincides with the end of the kingdom of our stars from the last podcast, the Hittites. The Hittites. 
Let's look for more clues among the ruins of Hattusha. The German archaeologist Jürgen Sia has published works about Hattusha and it suggests that Hattusha was abandoned before it was destroyed. So this suggests that the last king of the Hittites, Sapiluliuma II, would have known what was coming and arranged for the Hittite capital to have been evacuated with anything of value. Who would have chased the Hittites out of Hattusha? Whoever they were, they did a good job, as this was the last we hear of the Hittites in history. The Hittite disappearance is simply amazing, considering their dominance of Anatolia for 500 years or more, and also the fact that it has been a mighty empire under the leadership of the successful warrior king Sapiluliuma I, not more than 150 years previous. So who were the candidates and why did it happen? Before 1200 BCE, we are aware that the Hittites travelled across the sea to the island of Cyprus, a 40 mile sea crossing. It is not certain why the Hittites did this, but the most popular theory could be that the Hittites were securing the island's copper resources. If this is the case, then it is possible that the Hittites could have been struggling for resources for their bronze production. The people of Cyprus could have been linked to the Mycenaean Greeks in terms of their ethnicity. The invasion of Cyprus may not have been received well by the Mycenaeans. The Mycenaeans We haven't spoken about the Mycenaean Greeks yet and they will indeed have their own episode but unfortunately we are going to need to wait a while before we do that one. However, for the purposes of this podcast, it is going to be sensible to introduce the Mycenaean Greeks. The Mycenaean heartland is the southernmost part of the Balkan Peninsula, which we can identify as roughly the same area of the modern day country of Greece. These lands had been developing civilised societies since the 3rd millennium BCE and the peoples of the early ancient period are likely to be ancestral to the Mycenaeans, perhaps with a little bit of Minoan influence from the seafaring societies of the Mediterranean island of Crete. Hittite movements into Asua in western Anatolia in around 1400 BCE would have brought the Hittites to the eastern border of the Mycenaean kingdom. So the two kingdoms would have been very familiar with each other, not least of all because we believe that most, if not all, of the kingdoms in and around the Near East would have built a healthy trade network up involving each other. A lot of the problems we have when interpreting documents from this period is the marriage of names to denote any one particular ethnic group. So, for example, someone may tell you about Gaelic people and then someone else might tell you something about Irish people. To the person with no background knowledge of either, you might think we are talking about two distinct ethnic groups, when in actual fact most Irish people are also Gaelic people. Hittite documents from the Late Bronze Age reference a group of people called the Ahiyawa. We can't be certain, but this could be what the Hittites called the Mycenaeans. If we were to assume that the Ahiyawa that the Hittites refer to are actually the Mycenaeans, then it does appear that the Hittites had a lot of respect for them and their power, recognising them as a match for their might and holding them in the same regard as the other regional powerhouses of Egypt, Babylonia and Assyria. It may well have been the fact that the Mycenaeans had a grip 
on many of the islands of the eastern Mediterranean that enabled them to occupy Cyprus by the time the Hittites had decided to take that 40 mile sea crossing in order to possibly raid Cyprus for its copper resources. So if this is the reason and that is a big if then it is possible that trade had become more difficult and the Hittites were needing to try harder than usual to secure copper resources. The problem we have is that a lot of the reasoning is down to pure speculation due to the lack of written records. Was it the Mycenaean Greeks who destroyed Hattusha? Well, although towards the end it does appear that the Hittites had to retreat from their conquests in the western coastlines of Anatolia during the period of the Trojan Wars, it does seem unlikely that the Mycenaeans played any part in the ultimate downfall of the Hittite Empire, not least of all because the Mycenaean Empire was also in decline at this stage. From around 1250 BCE onwards, it appears that many Mycenaean cities had been subject to attack and the Mycenaeans, much like the Hittites, were throwing themselves into building projects with a lot of energy, possibly as a means of re-strengthening following attacks or threats of attacks. This was actually not enough, as after 1200 BCE, more and more of the mainland Mycenaean cities were destroyed, resulting in the ultimate destruction of the civilization as any kind of regional major player ever again. Basically, the Mycenaean culture was permanently crippled in a similar fashion and at a similar time to the Hittites. How is it possible that two neighboring kingdoms of significant size and strength were both destroyed somewhat simultaneously? The Assyrians. The last time we spoke at length about the Assyrians was when King Hammurabi of the first Babylonian dynasty asserted his dominance over the area in the 18th century BCE. But the Assyrians re-established a form of self-governance after the death of Hammurabi and remained quite healthy until the 14th century BCE, apart from a brief period of subjugation to the neighbouring Mitanni Empire and even subjugated the Mitanni for a period. The strength of what we call the Middle Assyrian Empire, which existed from the 14th to the 11th century BCE, was apparently a concern for those empires around them. After the Battle of Kadesh in the 13th century BCE, which brought the Hittites in direct conflict with the Egyptians, a peace treaty was created in which both parties agreed not to attack each other again and furthermore to unite against any third party that may attack either of them. And this could be in direct response to the expanding threat of the strengthening Assyrian Empire. The Hittites and the Egyptians did not need to be wasting their time and resources in battle against each other, only to leave themselves weakened and susceptible to the mighty Assyrians to their east, who were waiting to pounce on any unprotected piece of the Levant. After the Mitanni kingdom was initially weakened by the Hittites and then ultimately gobbled up by the Assyrians, the Hittites instigated trade embargoes on the Assyrians, possibly as a means to stunt further growth. Certainly the Babylonians saw fit to become involved in this trade embargo and there is evidence of the Hittites trying to encourage the Mycenaeans to do the same. However, despite all of these neighbouring empires clearly subjecting the Assyrians to restrictions in order to contain them, it does appear that this did not prevent the collapse of both the Hittites and the Mycenaeans. But the next natural question is, were the Assyrians to blame? Well, you could realistically speculate that the Assyrians 
could have made life very difficult for their Hittite neighbours, but they do seem quite distant from the Mycenaeans, so direct Assyrian involvement in their specific decline is highly unlikely. Although the Assyrians cashed in somewhat on the Hittite collapse by grabbing some available spoils for themselves, there does appear to be some form of consequence to the disappearance of some of their trading partners. The Assyrians enjoyed a prosperous period for some time after the disappearance of the Hittites and the Mycenaeans, but not so much after the middle of the 11th century when the Assyrian Empire appears to have shrunk considerably to a small area around the cities of Assur and Nineveh. The Babylonians So the Hittites and the Mycenaeans disappeared and the Assyrians went into a steep decline in the aftermath. Perhaps the Babylonians fared better. They were somewhat detached being down in southern Mesopotamia and were responsible for joining in the trade embargoes against the Assyrians before the region fell into crisis. We established that after the Hittite king Mershali had sacked Babylon, the Kassites moved into the city and the area. Initially, Kassite Babylonia had a very good trade relationship with the Assyrians, and as such they were able to firmly establish a strong dynasty. It was during the 14th century that the relationship between the Kassite Babylonians and the Assyrians began to alter. Assyria took a much more aggressive and subjugating approach to Kassite Babylonia and to some extent they found Assyria too irresistible thanks to its growing power. Even as the Assyrians started taking territories in the Mitanni kingdom, the Hittites were desperately trying to draw up treaties, alliances and trade embargoes targeting the Assyrians as the legitimate regional threat to its neighbours. While the Hittites and Egyptians were dealing with each other over in the west of the Near East, we can see that the Assyrians were seeking to subjugate Kassite Babylonia and attempt to turn it into a form of vassal state to further flex their muscles in the region. If the Kassite Babylonians weren't happy with this arrangement, it appears that the Assyrians were, and the Kassite Babylonians maintained suzerainty while under the direct influence of the Assyrians, who seemed more than happy to not crush the Kassite Babylonians completely. However, this could have been a bit of a mistake because the neighbouring Elamites from the east were, as ever, still very keen on poking their noses into the affairs of southern Mesopotamia and were able to conduct raids on Kassite Babylonian lands that ultimately led to the collapse of the Kassite dynasty in Babylonia in around 1155 BCE, after more than 400 years of established rule. The Elamites When it came to southern Mesopotamia, especially the region of Sumer, the Elamites had a habit of being a bit of a pest. The Elamites seem to have been a definite presence in the east of Sumer and similarly on the banks of the Persian Gulf. The Elamites always showed a resentment of Sumerian cultures, not readily accepting cuneiform writing or Semitic languages whenever the occupiers of Sumer attempted to subjugate them. There was a period after the expulsion of the Akkadians when the Guti people asserted their dominance over Elam in the same way that they had over the Sumerians. After the kings of the third dynasty of Or drove the Guti out of Sumer, the Elamites were able to re-establish themselves and sack Or, ending the third dynasty. In turn, the kings of the Sumerian city-state of Ishin drove the Elamites out of Ur. Historical evidence of what happened after this time is 
pretty patchy as the Elamites were using their own linear Elamite writing system which is yet to be successfully translated. The reason being that written artifacts are few and far between making translation almost impossible and contemporary written accounts unavailable for us to read. We do believe that the Elamites were trying to take advantage of the unrest between the kingdoms of Isin and Larsa while that was going on, but the Babylonians under Hammurabi soon put a stop to all of that. The Elamites re-established themselves again, and we call this the Middle Elamite period. The Middle Elamite period somewhat runs parallel with Kassite Babylonia. The Elamites battled frequently with the Kassites over land, but it was really the Assyrians who were the bosses as they invaded from the north, weakening the Kassite Babylonians and enabling the Elamites to enjoy the spoils. It was actually the Elamites who dealt the killer blow to the Kassite Babylonians before ultimately succumbing to the Assyrians in very quick succession in the 12th century BCE. So here we have yet another kingdom or empire disappearing during the 12th century BCE. The Hittites and the Mycenaeans were destroyed bit by bit. The Assyrians took advantage of this to an extent, but also the weakness of their Mitanni, Babylonian and Elamite neighbours. But the Assyrian Empire actually shrunk considerably over the course of the next century or two, which seems quite bizarre considering all of their success. So surely someone must have been reaping the rewards somewhere. The Egyptians We have not yet discussed the Egyptians, who were certainly involved in Near East politics as we discovered during the last podcast. The Battle of Kadesh between the Egyptians and the Hittites in 1274 BCE saw the two empires check each other before entering into peace talks that suggested they were stronger together in the event of a larger empire invading either of them. It seems likely that the considered threat on their minds would have been the powerful Assyrians. The period in question references the New Kingdom of ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt is indeed something we will explore in detail later on in the volume. If we leave the 13th century BCE behind and go forward to the 12th century BCE, we can discover that Ramesses III became the pharaoh in 1186 BCE. During his reign, Ramesses III would have to hold off many invasions. The Libyans attacked from the west. Libyans is the name given to those Africans who came from the west of Egypt. So we can call these people ancient Libyans. The other people recorded to have attacked Egypt are the Sea Peoples. Ramesses III ruled over a country that was often at war, and this caused great pressure on Egypt's economy. It seems as though there were food shortages exacerbated by the struggling economy, so Egypt was weakening towards the end of Ramesses III's reign. Ramesses' sons would bicker with each other over the future of the weakened country, and this in itself did little to solve any problems. Ultimately, the Kingdom of Egypt would fragment in around 1069 BCE, so yet another mighty kingdom succumbed to the late Bronze Age collapse. What on earth was going on that so many kingdoms and empires collapsed in such a short period of time, with absolutely no mighty replacement as one may historically expect? The Sea Peoples We need to take a closer look at what was going on and try to understand how something like this could have happened over such a large area. Firstly, 
it does seem like there was violence. The Hittite capital of Hattusha was abandoned and destroyed. Many Mycenaean Greek cities were destroyed and many conflicts took place, which could have come down to us in legend as the Trojan Wars. Egypt was fending off invaders, including these mysterious sea peoples. Who were the sea peoples? Nobody is really sure who the sea peoples are, but there is a wonderful air of mystery which surrounds them as they are mentioned in Egyptian texts and are a target for responsibility when trying to decipher the events leading up to the Bronze Age collapse. Historians have desperately been trying to pinpoint the origins and identity of the Sea Peoples. The big problem is that there doesn't seem to be a lot of agreement about who they were. The Egyptian texts refer to a number of different ethnic groups which are referred to collectively as the Sea Peoples. Some historians believe that the Philistines originated from one group of sea peoples called the Peleset. We know that the Peleset are mentioned in a number of Egyptian texts. The Philistines are mentioned as enemies of the Israelites in the Hebrew Bible. Although we believe that the Egyptians called them the Peleset, it appears that the Assyrians may have known them too and called them the Palestu. This may be the root of the origin of the name Palestine to refer to the modern region of the Levant. It is also speculated that the Philistines were displaced Mycenaean Greeks as it appears that there are similarities between their cultures and architecture. For me, the whole displacement theory is very interesting. It is possible that a lot of the regional disruption was caused by displaced people just looking for somewhere to live. Is this why we see sea peoples coming back time and again to Egypt? Were they looking to settle their own lands? Were they looking to integrate? It does seem like Pharaoh Ramesses III was using sea peoples in his very own army. One such group which appeared to have emerged as a result of migrating settlers were the Arameans. A Semitic peoples who originated in the lands of the modern country of Syria in the area of the modern city of Aleppo. They appear to have displaced many Amorites in their quest to find places to settle throughout the Levant. The Ugarit Letters Ugarit was a city on the banks of the Mediterranean Sea in the Levant and situated in the modern day country of Syria. It would be fair to say that Ugarit was a part of the Hittite Empire even though there is clear evidence of other international diplomatic ties. So what is so special about the city of Ugarit? Well, it offers a clue about what is going on in the lead up to the late Bronze Age collapse. During the reign of Sipiluliuma II, the last king of the Hittites, the city of Ugarit was being ruled by a king called Amurapi. Another kingdom which we are aware of is the copper-rich kingdom of Alashia, which is based on the island of Cyprus. King Amurapi of Ugarit wrote a letter to the kingdom of Alashia, clearly concerned for the future of the city. The troops and chariots of Ugarit had been sent to the north to join up with other Hittite armies, leaving the city of Ugarit susceptible to attack. This all appears to be in vain, as the city of Ugarit was ultimately sacked by these foreign invaders, possibly linked to these same sea peoples 
who had attacked Egypt. Troy was a city that suffered a similar fate at a similar time. Troy was located in the Çanakkale province of modern day Turkey. In fact, if we take a broad scope of the region at the time, we can see that many cities were sacked throughout the Mycenaean Empire and the Hittite Empire, as well as down the Levant coastline. Could the mysterious sea peoples that had attacked Egypt during the 12th century BCE have been responsible for all of the regional instability of the lands of the Eastern Mediterranean? Summary So let us summarise exactly what we have discovered about the late Bronze Age collapse and what could have happened to cause it. The one empire which people talk about with vigour when it comes to the when it comes to the discussion of the late Bronze Age collapse are the Hittites. The Hittites were a powerhouse of the known world in the second millennium BCE, and the late Bronze Age collapse marked the sudden and permanent end to the empire. Cities are believed to have been sacked and abandoned throughout the empire. Byblos, Ugarit, Aleppo and the Hittite capital of Hattusha all had similar fates. When looking for the perpetrators, we can see that the Mycenaeans suffered destruction of their own cities and empire in a similar fashion, with Troy, Mycenae and Knossos among the sacked Mycenaean cities. Across in the other corner of the Mediterranean, the Egyptian stance at the time of these sackings appeared to be one of taking defence, which was unusual in the days of the Middle Kingdom. Egypt was reportedly getting attacked by who they would call Sea Peoples. Were the Sea Peoples just chances? Were they displaced people from the Mycenaean Greek or Hittite empires? Were they the same people who attacked the Mycenaean Greek or Hittite empires? The empires to the east were not really ones to gain much from the decline and demise of the Mediterranean kingdoms. The Assyrians took a stance of aggression by overrunning and subjugating the Mitanni, the Kassite Babylonians and the Elamites, but in turn the Assyrians did not have the ability to maintain power over these remote lands and as such they had to revert to being a very small and centralised state surrounding its key cities only. It appears that the former empires did not re-emerge as one might expect. So, I am now under pressure to offer you an explanation as to what I believe happened during this period. Why did the late Bronze Age collapse happen? Well, I will stress that my opinion is one based only on my own personal studies conducted in the large part in the comfort of my own home, mainly with books and internet articles at my disposal. I am not an archaeologist with first-hand knowledge of any of the discoveries, so in this summary there may be things that I should have considered more seriously, but I do have a feeling about what I think may have happened and I often try to go for the most likely event as opposed to letting my imagination take over. So here is what I think happened and what I am basing it on. This is not the first time that we have seen dramatic shifts in human societies and in the past when we have seen a dramatic shift we have been able to often attribute it to some form of climate change. Society also appears to be very advanced by this stage and artefacts from the period demonstrate that all the empires and kingdoms show a healthy exchange of wares. The fact that bronze was being produced all over the region must have been the result of a healthy trade network due to the fact that tin was not native to any of these places. 
it had to be imported. During the prehistoric volume of podcasts, we introduced a branch of science called palynology, which is the study of small particles such as pollen, and with this we can look for clues about what was going on in the past. A palynological study from the late Bronze Age period demonstrates a climate change which may have been responsible for agricultural failures across the Near East. When agriculture fails, society begins to weaken as a consequence and if the rulers of the cities did not have the resources to act to prevent famine and poverty, then the citizens would become desperate and either create an uprising or look for somewhere else to live. If your city was failing, then you may go to the next city and attempt to invade it. That neighbouring city may be trying to defend itself, or more likely suffering in the same way with the breakdown of its society. In this case, peoples would revert back to a much more nomadic way of life, moving from place to place and attempting to invade other people's societies. This could explain why so many cities were attacked. And this could also explain why so many of these fortified and historically successful cities were overcome. Society had been weakened by drought. Mass migrations were taking place as peoples were moving in great numbers to try to find and establish new settlements. The more successful migrations that were taking place added to the number of the displaced peoples. Kingdoms would break down as cities would effectively have to fend for themselves, as was with the unfortunate case of Ugarit, where its army had been commissioned to defend other Hittite cities and Ugarit was left to be destroyed. These mass migrations of peoples would migrate over both land and sea, hence why the Egyptians believed that the peoples attacking them were sea peoples, as Egypt's weakest boundaries were its Mediterranean shores. An area of the Levant appears to have been settled by peoples adept at making pottery in the style of the Mycenaeans, so perhaps they were displaced from Mycenaean Greece. These people became what we know today as the Philistines. I believe that the Sea Peoples were not a united group of peoples collectively looking to raid lands like pirates, but were simply displaced populations simply looking for somewhere to live and requiring to do this by aggressive means. Their comparative success, which may have been in part due to the weakening of empires due to agricultural failures, also meant the disintegration of kingdoms as a whole and cohesion of kingdoms breaking down which in turn would have a major effect on national and international trade. As we can see in today's modern world, trade and economics are a finely balanced relationship that can be dramatically affected should anything go wrong. The financial crisis of 2007-2008 is described as emanating from one market in the United States of America and would affect the economies of the world by way of a knock-on effect. The same principle would have applied to the nations of the Near East and this is likely why the Assyrians did not prosper as a result of the destruction of the empires of the Levant. The previous trade relationships that the Assyrians enjoyed were no longer available now that the Hittites were no longer around. Near Eastern society would need to start all over again. The days of the mighty empires were over. We have already mentioned during the course of this podcast about the emergence of a Philistine settlement on the banks of the Mediterranean in the Levant lands formerly occupied by the Egyptian New Kingdom. Semitic peoples who came to be known as Arameans began to settle the fertile lands between the lands settled by the Philistines across to the Euphrates Valley, including the lands of the Euphrates Valley itself. Chaldeans settled the areas on the banks of the Persian Gulf where the mighty city of Ur 
once prospered. An Indo-European Phrygian society began to emerge in the remnants of northwestern Anatolian lands previously occupied by the Hittites. The late Bronze Age collapse was not the end of society as we know it, but it was more like a reset button needed to be pressed. Societies had become comfortable over a period of four centuries and they had become so internationally dependent on each other that the breakdown of one completely destroyed the very infrastructure of the whole network of superstates. The clock had been turned back by about a thousand years and kingdoms and empires would need time to re-emerge and maybe learn lessons from what had happened here. Next time we are going to study one of the empires of the Near East that we have mentioned many times in the past but deserves further analysis especially when it comes to how they got through the Dark Age following the Late Bronze Age collapse. They are the Assyrians. Thank you very much for joining me again and listening to this podcast. A fascinating subject this week. Thank you very much for joining me. We have had over 50,000 listens to the podcast, which is a phenomenally huge number uh, that I never expected to get to. So 50,000, wonderful stuff. Thank you. A couple of messages we've received through Twitter. Uh, The first one I'm going to read out is from Matty Yokimo. Hope I've uh, pronounced your name correctly. Uh, He's put, OMG, this is exactly what my kind of just got interested in history again at an older age and now thinks about studying history at Open University at least, needs now. Just got through episode three, but I'm getting there. Keep this up. Uh, Thank you, Matty. Thanks for that message. Another message, uh, Ricardo Shortiano, just found your podders on TuneIn Radio. Thank you so much for an easy listening foray. Uh, Thank you for letting me know that you picked it up on TuneIn. That's uh, quite valuable, that. And also, thanks for getting in touch with the podcast. It really does mean a lot to me that you make the effort to let me know that you're out there and you're listening to the podcast and... It's uh, very good for me to hear from you about how you think the podcast is going and what you like and don't like about it, where you picked it up, where you first heard it, that kind of thing. It's uh, of great value, so keep the messages coming. Nyla Rainey got in touch with the podcast. She, uh, She got in touch with me through the Facebook forum. She writes, Hello, I've been enjoying listening to your podcast. I listen mostly at night when I can't sleep. Well, that just goes to validate all those people that say that I can send them to sleep very easily just by talking. Uh, Just finished listening to episode 11. I'm a resident of British Columbia, Canada, and I find the history of migration and settlements fascinating. Uh, She then goes on to uh, tell me about uh, an article relating to the migration into the Americas and it's uh, another one of those fascinating sites which feed uh, material into that argument relating to how long ago humans migrated into the Americas so there's sort of two theories there's one from about 15,000 years ago and the other from about 25,000 years ago and if you want to listen to more about the arguments of that I suggest you go back and listen to episode 11 just as Nyla has done and um, there should be some interesting information in that that will uh, give you some some food for thought more than anything Uh, it's episode 11 in volume 1 and it's uh, the settling the world part 2 if I'm not mistaken anyway thanks for sending me the article Nyla I may well post it on the Facebook page so that everyone can get a, a look at that Uh, One big piece of news for the podcast this week is that we now have a Patreon account um, where you can actually make donations to the podcast. Now, the podcast isn't going to switch direction. It's always going to be fundamentally a free resource. So that's the whole ethos behind the creation of it. It's never going to cost you any money to be able to listen to this podcast. However... 
Having said that, obviously there are running costs involved in the podcast and equipment, uh, materials like books that have to be bought and the website has to be paid for. Um, I'm not particularly desperate for the money, but uh, if you do want to contribute towards the running costs, it would be greatly appreciated. And uh, I am yet to work out a reward system for those of you that are kind to make any contributions towards the podcast i will work something out and i'll report back to you on that it's the least i can do for your generosity uh, but just so you know if you do want to make donations to the podcast visit our patreon site and uh, it's on the social media pages if you want to link through to it however there's no obligation whatsoever history of the world podcast is a free resource Matty Yokimo, um, from uh, who I mentioned earlier in the podcast, uh, who got in touch from uh, through the Twitter forum, has already come in and started making a contribution towards the podcast. So thank you, thank you so much, Matty. You deserve a special mention. And um, I'm sure I will be getting in touch with you directly once I've worked out the History of the World podcast uh, rewards uh, scheme for those patrons who are kind enough to contribute I think I've got one last message here that I'd like to mention from uh, Yang Richter who um, who posted a message on the Facebook page said thank you for your work uh, I was looking for a thorough podcast that would go chronologically from the dawn of man towards the present and uh, this is exactly the podcast for history nerds. There are a lot of episodes ahead of us, uh, you're telling me. I would have one wish, though. I think the audio quality could be improved a little bit more. There is still some background noise, and the sound quality of spoken word could be a little bit better, and it could help us. Not English native speakers to hear better. I don't have a problem with the British accent, though. I know such equipment is not cheap, but it would be greatly appreciated, I think. Greetings from Prague. Well, thank you, Jan, for getting in touch with the podcast. Um, always um, very interested to hear your opinions on the quality of the sound of the podcast. Now, um, this uh, wonderful piece of equipment that I did buy before starting out this Blue Yeti microphone has served me extremely well and I've been very pleased with it however I'm not really sure I don't have a great deal of feedback regarding the, the sound quality and often no news is good news so I believe that the sound quality was okay but if you're experiencing difficulties with the uh, with the quality of sound please do let me know. Adjustments can be made with the existing equipment, so it doesn't mean that I have to go out and spend hundreds um, on all new equipment. Um, it might just be that I'm dampening the volume too much um, or something uh, or something else related. Just uh, write in, let me know uh, if uh, you think the, uh, the sound, the quality of the sound can be improved. Anyway... Enough about that, I've been rambling on and on and on too much this week. It was a good episode, a good long episode with plenty of great information in it. And uh, we'll look forward to next week where we look at the mighty Assyrian Empire and how it changed over the, over the years that it was active. So it was the Assyrian Empire was around in lots of different forms for many, many years. We're going to have a closer look at that next week. Thank you once again for listening in and I hope you all have a wonderful week. The History of the World podcast is hosted by Audioboom. It is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Castbox, Podcast Republic, Stitcher and TuneIn. You can also find it on Deezer, Google Podcasts and Radio Public feel free to email the show at historyoftheworldpodcast at mail.com join our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter 